good evening and good afternoon to our speakers, chairs, and audiences of ACNS webinars. We are back again with another session of insightful lectures for you. The first speaker for today is our honored guest and a legend in the field of skull based surgery, Professor Kenji Ohata. Professor Ohata is a professor and specially appointed professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Osaka City University, Faculty of Medicine, Japan. He was a past president of the International Meningioma Society and an active member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. He is an invited faculty for several workshops and conferences organized by various international societies around the world. He is the author of more than 300 publications and several book chapters. We are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Ohata for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today he is going to talk about surgery of tuberculum cell meningioma, transcranial or transpenoidal root. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from the United Kingdom, Professor Nitin Mukherjee. Professor Mukherjee is the Divisional Lead of Research, Lead of Cerebrovascular Services and Consultant at the James Cook University Hospital, Middlesbrough, UK. Professor Mukherjee is a noted author and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the British Journal of Neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker for our webinars. Today he is going to talk about the 7mm conundrum in unruptured and familial aneurysms. The Chair for the first session of today is Professor Miguel Ares from Spain. Professor Ares is the Director and Co-Founder of the International Ares Institute as well as the Professor and Chairman Department of Neurosurgery, Carlos Haya University Hospital, University of Malaga, Spain. Professor Ares is the chairman of the WFNS Foundation, and he has adorned several important administrative positions in his wise illustrious career. He has been decorated with several awards and honors for his contribution towards neurosurgery in the world. We are extremely honored and thankful to him for chairing the session of Professor Ohata. The chair for the second session of today is Professor Stephen Florian from Romania. Professor Florian is a professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery, Cluj County Emergency Hospital, Cluj Napoca, Romania. He was a past president of the Romanian Society of Neurosurgery and the second vice president at large of the WFNS. He is an noted author and research with several publications in various internationally peer reviewed journals. He was decorated with many awards and honors for his contribution towards neurosurgery in his country. We are extremely honored to have him today, which has a session of Professor Mukherjee. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Nicolares. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Raya. First of all, I'd like to thank the leadership of the Asian uh, CNS for the kind invitation to co-chair this uh, wonderful session with my very good friend, Professor Florian. Uh, thank you to you and also thank you to Professor Yoko Kato very good friend, a very active international leader in neurosurgery. And congratulations also for the choice of the topic and the choice of the speakers, uh, particularly regarding the, my, my session, uh, regarding Professor uh, Ohata. We know uh, that uh, endoscopy came to stay, but uh, in certain topics like tuberculosis, uh, <coughs> there are still many issues and many concerns regarding the best surgical approach, transcranial, transesphenoidal, and I'm completely sure that Professor Ohata is going to uh, give some light regarding many nuances and many uh, questions uh, about this uh, topic. So it's uh, for me a great honor and great pleasure to ask Professor Ohata from Osaka City University to start his talk about surgery of tuberculosis cell meningioma transcranial of uh, transesphenoidal, Professor Ohata. Okay, thank you very much for the, I uh, introduced myself and thank you uh, Raja for kindly inviting me to the uh, ACNS uh, webinar seminar. Okay, thank you uh, for giving me opportunity to talk about my philosophy of surgery of the tuberculum serum in Joma. So I re remake my slide, which has been used for the last uh, 10 years. I want to focus on the approach to the tuberculosis meningioma. So tuberculosis meningioma uh, originate from the uh, tuberculosis, of course, but there are so many tumor arise from this area, inside the cella, outside the cella, on the cella, supracella part. So uh, based on the origin of the tumor, we must select the appropriate approach. So tuberculosis cellular meningioma originate between optic nerves along this area. So there's a so wide area. 
So there's so many kinds of uh, spirochera meningioma. One is arise in front of the optic nerve. Uh, some arise from between spirochera. Some uh, arise from the behind uh, optic nerves. So this is my uh, illustration, uh, anatomical relation to the surrounding structures. If the tumor is uh, relatively small, small it's uh, just push the optic nerves laterally and push the ACOM complex posterior superiorly. And uh, as it growing, it start to involve the ACOM complex and start to uh, adhesion uh, to to the on the optic nerves. So this is a schematic drawing uh, regarding the growth pattern of the tuberculosis meningioma. Usually, it, it invades to the medial wall of the optic canal. And this is a uh, some uh, uh, standard type of the growth. So even if the tumor is small, tumor some tumor extend inside to the optic canal like this. So there's a, so many approach reported. So approach is matter of discussion regarding how to remove this uh, tumors. So from the basal approach, from the lateral approach, lateral, uh, from the orbital approach and lateral approach, and some uh, uh, from just a frontal approach, front basal approach, and transphenoidal approach. I want to uh, discuss and uh, which approach is appropriate to this particular pathology. So I want to firstly uh, present bilateral subfront approach for tuberculosis meningioma. I reported this uh, uh, approach in general neurosurgery considering the possible future use of the endoscopic approach, I summarize my outcome, which uh, operated transcranial approach. This is my uh, uh, favorite approach by frontal uh, approach uh, craniotomy, And then I remove the orbital ring in the, on the one side So if the tumor extends to the laterally, I additionally uh, use a terional craniotomy. So in some case, side of uh, extent of craniotomy is so wide. So this is a, a unilateral approach. Of course, extent of craniotomy is large, uh, but usually I, I main access is one side. So uh, there is a olfactory nerve located between tumor and the surgeon. So I cut one side of the olfactory nerve intentionally because uh, in order to remove the radical removal, so this is a olfactory nerve is big obstacle. I cut the unilateral olfactory nerve, but I perfectly preserve the contralateral olfactory nerve. So we must dissect the olfactory nerve through the unilateral side. And I open the both optic canal. And then we can safely remove the tumor uh, from the medial side of the optic nerve. This is a perfect approach as far as I know. So I want to show the similar approach. And if the tumor is a large tumor involving the ACOM complex, I use an interhemispheric approach combined with a bilateral front basal approach. So if you use a both front basal approach, you may sacrifice the both olfaction and patient loss uh, olfaction. So this is a bilateral approach is not, uh, I don't like to recommend. So this is uh, my approach, unilateral approach. Uh, bilateral craniotomy is uh, performed to preserve the contralateral olfactory nerve. I want to show one case. First case is a 55 year old female. This is a just very, very small case. 
and the patient is our vision is uh, uh, intact. I want I like to use a visual impairment score to evaluate the visual function. This uh, uh, method is presented by Professor Fabrish, as you know. This is a very small case. I unfortunately I use a front lateral approach. I don't like to say unfortunately or fortunately. So this is a fact. The tumor is completely located behind the optic nerve like this. And fortunately, tumor is very soft. So I can remove the tumor uh, after opening and roofing the optic nerve. Tumor is very soft. If the tumor is hard and consistent, so total rejection may be impossible. So transcranial approach, of course, is good, but unilateral approach is, uh, in some case, not enough good for the tumor total rejection. So I am happy, patient also happy, because tumor is so soft. So this is a limitation of the transcranial approach. So tumor is so soft, I can completely preserve the uh, or olfactory nerve and I co coagulate the attachment. This is a fact of the surgery of the uh, uh, tubercular cellular meningioma. Next case is the medial side tumor, not so large. Uh, ACOM complex is uh, involved by tumor. Patient has a, a tumor with a visual, uh, partial visual uh, defect. This is a relatively light. Uh, craniotomy. This is a bilateral frontal craniotomy with a unilateral orbital orbitotomy. This is a basic uh, my procedure and uh, contralateral craniotomy is performed just to dissect the olfactory nerve. If you use a frontolateral approach, I of course use a frontolateral approach. In some case, patient loss uh, or function because the gravity makes the frontal lobe downward and it tracks the olfactory nerve and finally after the operation patient loss the olfaction. This is a nightmare for me. So in this case I open the interhemisk fissure. So this tumor is relatively soft and I start I cut the first form fold to prevent the uh, uh, undue compression to the optic nerve. This is a, uh, you know, uh, branch of ACOM is involved. So this is very safe. And I'm, I can preserve the all perforator from the ACOM compress. So that is why I like to uh, recommend to use uh, inter uh, by frontal approach to the many most of the neurosurgeon who want to start to operate on the tuberculosis meningioma. This is very safe. So under the wide exposure of the tumor, we can uh, nicely expose the uh, ACOM complex. And in order to uh, remove the tumor uh, completely, I of course recommend to use a uh, uh, transcranial approach and then, of course, most of the case, if required, I never hesitate to open the optic canal. So in this case, tumor embed to the medial cavity of the uh, optic canal. So, you, you know, this is a very safe in, in, internal carotid artery. is nicely preserved like this. And there is a adhesion of the tumor to the medial side of the optic nerve, but we access to the optic nerve to the medial side. So dissection of the optic nerve is not so difficult. So in this case, I injure the internal carotid artery. I, I, I don't like to see it. this is my tumor, but I can nicely uh, preserve this uh, internal carotid artery. In some case, Due to the uh, arterial sclerosis, tumor, some carotid artery uh, shift to the medially. In this case, 
I nicely preserve the uh, mucosa of the sphenoid sinus. This technique is very important to prevent the CS leak. I insert uh, some uh, gelatin sponge and further covered with uh, abdominal fat tissue. This is a basic technique. I recommend to use the uh, interhemisca uh, by frontal approach. Next case is uh, also the relatively uh, large uh, tumor meningioma. Patient has a visual field defect. And this is, uh, I want to show the anatomical variant of the uh, ophthalmic artery. So uh, basically surgical taking same as I shown uh, previously. This is, uh, now I start to open the uh, optic canal after the decompression. Look at this. This is the redundant ophthalmic artery. It's a uh, uh, redundant, and this, if you accept to the bureau, th th there is a danger of the injury of this very important artery. So this is a uh, anatomical variation. Some patient has a, uh, uh, shift of the carotid artery to medial side. In this case, so I uh, opening the contralateral optic canal from the ipsilateral side. So, you know, I dissect the ipsilateral uh, olfactory nerve completely to preserve the olfaction. So, this is a basically unilateral approach, but uh, I like to use the bilateral chronotomy. So this is an intercabinal sinus open. Of course, mucosa in the spinal sinus completely preserved to prevent the uh, CF to leak. This is a pituitary gland. This is a pituitary stock. We can uh, uh, remove the, the tumor from the transcranial approach. This is outcome. Outcome is perfect. So this is uh, another case uh, of the tumor cellular meningioma. I want to show the how to remove the uh, unroof the optic channel. I this is a one part importance of the, this technique. So you know optic canal, this is a unblocked dissection. So contralateral uh, olfactory now is perfectly uh, preserved. So this is outcome. Optic is very nice. Finally, so I want to show the one case of the tuberculosis meningioma, which involving the uh, ACOM compress. This is a 23-year-old male presented with a, a bilateral hemianopsia, tumor is large. I, so I use a bifrontal combined with the interhemispheric approach. So uh, superior uh, cellular sinus is uh, transected at the anterior side and the contralateral olfactory nerve is completely preserved and if cellular side is transected. So this is a uh, uh, interhemic fascia. So this part of the, is well exposed and uh, in order to wide exposure of the tumor because the focus is how to preserve the ACOM compress. So this is the right uh, frontal hemisphere. This is a, a left frontal hemisphere. So uh, both hemisphere retracted by a uh, retractor. And then I start to remove the tumor. This is a light optic nerve. It's unroofed and the tumor rejected from the right side. This is a left optic channel is open for the radical tumor rejection because this is a very young patient. So goal of the tumor is total rejection. So this is a very useful approach we can open the both side of the optic canal nicely. This is the light optic nerve. And I also open the intercabinal sinus. This is the spinal sinus and the mucosa is totally preserved. 
And this is a, a pituitary stroke. It usually, in case of the uh, Dublin cellular meningioma, swell, uh, stroke is never involved. This is a right A2, and uh, this is a left A2 complex. And this is A com complex. Uh, totally preserved, uh, involved by the tumor. And uh, I left behind some small piece of tumor around the ACOM complex. This is, uh, this is you know, uh, sphenoid sinus mucosa is preserved. And I finally put uh, inside the uh, gelatin sponge and uh, abnormal fat. This is the final outcome of this case. This is a stock and uh, bilateral optic nerves. This is, uh, I want to show the how uh, useful uh, the transcranial approach is. So this is outcome, of course, some small piece of the tumor left behind. I follow this case for the last, uh, for the recent 10 years, there's uh, no recurrence yet. So the uh, digital tumor is so small, if the tumor start to recur, I will gamma knife. So next case is uh, optic canal tumor. Uh, this is optic nerve six meningioma. This is a different entity. I still, so I want to uh, uh, say transcranial approach very useful in this case. Uh, this is, uh, so left side, I use uh, bilateral frontal craniotomy and the tumor invading the left optic canal. Of course, entire part of the optic canal must be opened in these cases. So if you use a uh, endoscopic endonasal approach, the tumor above the optic canal could not be removed, of course. So transcranial approach, maybe it's uh, uh, the one of the best approach, not the best, not perfect, but the better approach as compared to the endonasal endoscopic approach. So I open the optic canal using the sonopet. This is a contralateral optic canal. This is a, a by front basal approach. In this small case, interhemispheric opening is not required. So the, just I put the uh, lit, two retractor under the bilateral frontal lobe. And this is a, 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 a ipsilateral optic nerve. Com completely, I still continue to open the optic canal to uh, achieve the radical rejection. This is a left side optic nerve, this side optic nerve. So opening is wide to access uh, the, the tumor around the anterior coronal process. So this is a final outcome. So transcranial approach is the best, one of the best choice. I keep the, the mucosa of the sweno sinus intact to prevent the CSF leak. This is a right optic nerve left optic nerve, tumor all around the left optic nerve is uh, removed. So I follow this case eight years already, and there's no, this is uh, no recurrence. So uh, this is the last case I want to show which operated by transcranial approach. This is a diaphragmus ceramin geoma. This is a totally different entity of the uh, meningioma around the supracellular area. So this is a, so I access by frontal approach like this. This is a right optic nerve and left optic nerve here. I firstly perform the uh, internal debulking of the tumor and then I start to dissect the tumor from the uh, right optic nerve. Uh, right refractive nerve is completely preserved. I dissect, divide the left optic nerve to have uh, enough vision, enough view to the uh, 
supracell area. This is an indentation of the right optic nerve. This is the right side. There is a tight, very, very tight adhesion. So uh, different from the uh, tubercle cellular meningioma, diagonal cellular meningioma originate is the same system as uh, optic nerve located. This uh, tumor originate in the supracellular system. So there is a very tight adhesion to the stalk and very tight adhesion to the optic nerve. This is a different entity from the tubercle cellular meningioma. We are confusing and then some tumor left behind. This is a CT scan. So this is a outcome. So I operate this case three times. And finally, I send this case to the gamma center. Now I follow this case for the last 10 years. And fortunately, there's no recurrence. So I want to show my clinical data in my series. I analyzed 34 cases for operators for the 15 years. There is a, this, this case is increased in five cases. Uh, tumor size ranges from the 14 to the 45 millimeter. So these cases, 34 cases, including 26 tuberculosis meningioma, eight diaphragmocera meningioma. I use, like to use a visual impairment score, which is published by Professor Farbis. Uh, this is a zero is a bit, bit the normal, 100 is uh, the worst, blind, nearly blind. This is uh, the summary of cases. I'm sorry, so I analyzed uh, VIS score in all cases, pre OP uh, score, post OP score, in the short post operative time and longer uh, follow up time. And this is a visual defect, it's uh, shown in this uh, uh, slide. I operate 34 cases for the four, uh, 15 years, number of cases not so many. And uh, out, out of 40, 34 cases, Simpson grade one surgery uh, attempted in the 31 case and uh, nearly total of Simpson grade one to three performed in among 27 cases. So uh, 29 cases shows an uh, improvement in the uh, visual impairment score. Uh, no case showed the worsening of the vision. So six case showing the normalization of the vision in the two weeks after operation. And the 26 cases is unchanged. But if we follow these cases, one year, uh, 23 out of the 26 cases show further improvement because we preserve the perforators around the optic nerves. So uh, I'm sorry to show the complicated this. Pre operation VIS is 39.2. Post operation in the short period is improved to 24.8. In the long follow up period, it further improves. And length of the follow up period is like uh, set five to uh, six years. So this is our uh, uh, data here. So there is a many publication regarding the uh, tuberculosis serum meningioma surgery. As far as I, I know, my outcome is the best uh, as far as my, I, I search the literatures. So some case shows no uh, improvement, but no worsening because by frontal transcranial approach can provide us a wide exposure of the tumor. We can uh, preserve all perforators and we can preserve the uh, optic nerves. Of course, total rejection is not uh, uh, possible in all cases. Some cases possible and some cases impossible, but the, the importance is preserve the function. So now key to improve preserve visual function is wide exposure, careful preservation of blood supply to optic apparatus and early in unroofing of the channel is very important. 
So next topic is how about the endonasal endoscopic approach for tubercle cell angioma. Now endoscopic approach is now cutting edge technology. Now we start to use this uh, approach to the cranial pharyngioma, of course, including the pituitary adenoma. This is uh, getting a standard approach. How about the use of the endoscopic approach to the tubercle cell angioma? So this is, uh, I want to uh, show my concept, uh, imaginary concept of the surgery to the tubercle cell angioma from the uh, below. This is the extent of the tumor. This is a hole. Endoscope inserted. Of course, we can remove the tumor totally because uh, uh, there's a sleeve of the tumor. Tumor extension extended to the all around the optic nerve. So this is uh, also imaginary image of the tumor cell meningioma. This is unlike schwannoma. Meningioma affected widely. So if uh, we access below, we remove some part, but outside of the, of the canal, some part of the tumor left behind. This is because of the attachment. This is not uh, uh, like uh, craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma has no attachment to the, me to the meningus. So if we use a transcranial approach, we can observe all part of the tumor. So we can perform the radical resection. If there is a other adhesion, of course, we can, we must leave the, some small piece of the tumor around the optic nerve or ACOM complex. Of course, there is a limitation. So I use of endoscope, I is depend on whether or not, or not, if we can predict the extent of the tumor invasion to the surrounding anatomy before operation. If the tumor is uh, limited medial to the optic canal, transvenal endoscopic approach may be available like this because we can open the optic canal from below. So the matter of discussion is where or not we can predict the tumor invasion before the operation. So I, in order to uh, do this research, I analyzed 31 cases, review of the intraoperative video and blinded prediction of the tumor invasion in the preoperative MRI. I published this data uh, in 2016. I want to show this is a very interesting data. There's a 31 cases, uh, cases analyzed. This is a, a detail of the patient tumor size is not so large as compared to the cases in India. This is a micro or hata classification. I want to show several classification. So grade zero is no invasion to the optic canal. Grade one is a secondary invasion. Grade two is partial invasion including one, one, one uh, part of the side of the optic canal. This is grade two M. Grade two I is uh, invasion to the inferior part of the optic canal. And grade two SM is two wall invasion. Grade two IM, grade three is uh, invasion to the above and medial inferior to the optic canal. This is uh, my classification. So our result is grade one invasion was found in four cases. Grade three M invasion was found in the 11 case. Grade three in medial, only medial invasion found in three cases. Grade two SM, two oral invasion found in three cases. Grade two only uh, invade the superior oral found in one case. This is three oral invasion found in 17 cases out of uh, uh, 62 side of the optic nerve, optic canal. So this is the result. So tumor invasion was found unilaterally in 21 case, bilaterally in six cases out of 31 cases. 
So MR prediction for optic nerve invasion is possible only in 21% of the cases. So I want to say, I said it was impossible to tell the characteristics of the tumor invasion before the operation. This is a limitation to use a, a, a endoscopic endonasal approach to this particular pathology. But I want to say there's a, the uh, uh, tremendous role of the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach in this particular pathology. This is a case of diagonal cellar meningioma. Uh, this is a 70, a 47 year old male presented with severe visual loss on the both side. This is a very large one. This is a tuberculosis cellular meningioma, uh, no, not a tuberculosis cellular meningioma. This is a diagonal cellular meningioma and patient has a progressive uh, visual loss. So what I want to uh, uh, perform is a decompression of the both optic nerve as soon as possible. So this is, uh, you know, uh, we already report a posterior cunidinoidectomy approach in the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. As far as uh, we use the standard endonasal approach, just we can uh, remove the part of the tumor under the vision of the endoscope. If we remove the posterior cunidinoid process, we can remove the, the entire part of the tumor. We published this uh, uh, posterior cranioidectomy approach in Journal of Neural Surgery in 2019. If you would like to see, please check this journal. So we use posterior cranioidectomy approach in this case. This is an uh, operation performed by uh, uh, successor Professor Goto. This is a nice approach. This is a tubangusera drilled out and the uh, mid part of the cellar floor is opened. This is a uh, tubercular cellar, dura is opened widely. This is a uh, optic nerve. So this is a uh, posteocranoidectomy approach. So, so the, what you, you can see is a tumor, tumor and the tumor. So, because this is an internal decompression, technically same as performed in the transcranial approach, essence of tumor rejection is first internal debulking. This is optic knob here. Now you can see the ACOM compress later. This is tumor. Uh, for, fortunately, tumor is soft. So this is optic knob. So we can uh, dissect the optic knob very safely. And now we continue the tumor dissection. Tumor is fortunately soft. This is a uh, perforators. So this is a very nice approach. Of course, we cannot see all the dural attachment around the optic nerve, but decompression of the tumor from the center of the skull base is very, very good. So this is, uh, you know, I want to show the, this is a visual artery. And finally, we suture the dura as much as possible. Do the uh, Fishman uh, procedure of the uh, suture technique. I, we insert the fat taste taken from abdomen. So, you know, of course, transcranial approach uh, is a uh, uh, very good approach, but in the, some selected case, I can recommend to use an uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. This is a fisherman's knot procedure. We already published the technique in the journal uh, neurosurgery video uh, chapter. If you like, please check this procedure. So finally, we successfully close the wound. This is outcome. Look at this. This is a very uh, useful uh, to use the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. So, but some tumor attachment left behind. Of course, this is a limitation, but advantage of the endoscopic endonasal approach. 
So, of course, we start to use uh, endoscopic transcranial approach under the concept of the minimally invasive neurosurgery. This is a relatively small one presented with a visual defect. This operation performed also by meant, uh, successor professor Goto. We use a unilateral uh, supraorbital small craniotomy, and this is an endoscopic uh, technique. Because we use uh, uh, select this approach because the tumor invasion is a uh, little bit small, and I, I said transcranial approach is best selection to remove the uh, tubering cellular meningioma. So our concept is same, just we, but we use the uh, uh, endoscope instead of the microscope. This is a good technique. We can observe the optic channel above. Of course, there is a limitation as I shown in the first case of the tumor rejection, tumor, some tumor uh, located behind the optic nerve, but we can remove the tumor because tumor is relatively soft. We can insert the cursor as well because we have a good development of the micro instrument. This is a drill. Of course, some neurosurgeon in India can remove the tumor in one hour, one hour. Of course, you have many cases in India also and the uh, Asian part, this is uh, open the spinal sinus. We must, uh, of course, close this part of the, the defect. This is a controller optic nerve. Surgical concept is same. We can must open the controller uh, optic canal and of course, we must uh, uh, repair the defect of the tumor, the skull base. This is the final part of the surgery. This is outcome. So this is a minimally invasive uh, transcranial endoscopic approach. To some selected case, we can use endoscopic approach through the uh, supraorbital craniotomy. So, I want to finally mention the future of the uh, large tumor cellular meningioma. This is a case uh, of the uh, ACTH producing pituitary adenoma. We use a transcranial supra uh, orbital endoscopic approach and transferoidal endoscopic approach sim simultaneously. So this is a you know a view. This is the supra uh, orbital approach under the endoscope, and this is the transparent approach by endoscope. So five neurosurgeons working together, two neurosurgeons for the transcranial approach, and three neurosurgeons, uh, two neurosurgeons for the endoscopic endonasal approach, one neurosurgeon assist organize all operation. This is a, you know, uh, pituitary adenoma is very soft. So we can use this approach, but now we have a future when we start to use uh, both techniques simultaneously, even for the tuberum cellular meningioma operation. So, so this is outcome. This is a combined simultaneous endoscopic transcranial approach combined with uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a case of craniopharyngioma. So this is my conclusion slide. There is a many variation of the cellular meningioma in relation to the surrounding structures. Secondly, transcranial approach is preferable as compared to endoscopic approach. If the total rejection is goal of surgery, if the decompression is a first choice, uh, prioritize in some case. I still, uh, we, we, of course, we can recommend to use endoscopic endonasal approach. This is a, you know, you must select the case and endonasal endoscopic approach is beneficial for the muscle reduction. And combined transcranial endonasal approach with endoscopic endonasal approach will be considered in some selected case in future. This one, you know, this is Shohei Otani 
he is a major league baseball player. He is both hand hybrid baseball player. He is a, now as uh, a home run batter, uh, good uh, batter, and he is a good pitcher as well. So one neurosurgeon must know the endoscopic transcranial approach and endoscopic endonasal approach, both. And you have a good uh, neurosurgeon in your institute, you can simultaneously use both endoscope, transcranial and endonasal approach. So this is the final message. So evolution of the skull-based surgery may continue. So this is a logistic curve. Uh, this is a all growth of the all things. We have early phase, growth phase, and the hyper growth phase, and the mature phase, and the penetration of the technique. This is a curve. If we like to continue to grow, keep this, this curve, we must uh, 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 need uh, 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 some uh, first generation, first three, second generation. This is uh, maybe a uh, uh, microscopic operation. This is an uh, endoscopic operation. Third generation of operation, we must think about this one. I'm, I want to say we need uh, some uh, uh, innovation regarding the uh, microscope and and uh, endoscopic uh, uh, optic uh, uh, devices. So I hope younger generation keep to uh, keep this card. This is uh, my last uh, message. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ohata, for this wonderful presentation. I think that uh, you really master the topic of uh, tuberculosis cell meningioma. I very much, uh, I think we all very much enjoy your beautiful videos. And uh, well, you have covered transcranial approaches, uh, you have covered uh, transesphenoidal, and also these beautiful cases of combined microsurgery, uh, endoscopic microsurgery, if I may say, and transesphenoidal. I have one. Uh, I have identified one question from the from the audience. Uh, is uh, one of them is uh, from Professor Patek, who is uh, wondering about the advantage of bilateral approach because sometimes uh, it seems that from one side the lesion could be removed. So Professor Patek is uh, wondering about the usefulness of bifrontal approach. Okay, this is a very, very, may I answer the question? This is a very good question. I, so just uh, 20 years ago, I used a front, unilateral front lateral approach. And uh, you know, regarding the tumor dissection, in some case, it's good enough for the tumor dissection. But you know, she, if the elderly patient, after the CSF sucking, frontal lobe getting sink, Think you know, and uh, it trapped injures the uh, olfactory nerve on the contralateral side, and finally patient lost the olfaction. This is a nightmare for Japanese people because they couldn't enjoy the the uh, some uh, you know eating. Smell is very very important, but one of the best important neurological function is olfaction. Of course, this is a very very tiny nerve. In order to preserve the contralateral olfaction, I perform the bifrontal craniotomy. The, the 20 years ago, I tried to perform the dissection of olfactory nerve from the unilateral side, but it's so difficult. Difficult, you know, just the size of the craniotomy is not matter for the patient. Patient has just one operation in his only one life. You know, we neurosurgeon operate many cases a, a week or a, a year, but for the patient, one operation, if they lost the olfaction, this is a nightmare. That is why I found the bifrontal craniotomy. Technically possible, you know, we can use a small craniotomy, supraorbital approach for endoscope. I am still wondering regarding the olfaction after the supraorbital uh, uh, 
endoscopic approach. You know, I have the same, same uh, matter of the question regarding this uh, particular approach. So I think uh, the younger generation must know the characteristics of the surgery of the uh, tubercular muscular meningioma. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I completely agree with you in, in many cases for the subfrontal unilateral, uh, subfrontal interhemispheric approach. I do like very much this approach, but I, I have to confess that I use this approach basically for uh, difficult craniopharyngioma and some other midline tumors. I'm uh, still uh, preferring unilateral approach, but I do appreciate your, your comment. And there is also another question from Professor or Dr. Patek regarding uh, the techniques. I'm not sure of having understood the, the question, but um, it's uh, about uh, whether or not you always use two hands technique and who is uh, holding the uh, endoscope or whether you have any, let's say, fixed folder for that. Yeah, so this is also a good question. We have uh, uh, endoscopist. I, we asking the assistant to hold the endoscope. This is a uh, very good for the training as well. Of course, we have uh, some uh, fixed type uh, endoscope like uh, Olympus. I we I I don't like to use. We can move the endoscope and we can understand the 3D image by moving the endoscope. So assistant folding, assistant folding. Young doctor fold and one surgeon, we, we are completely doing the uh, forehand operation and operator use both hand. Assistant, first assistant use both hand and the second assistant hold the endoscope. This is good okay. for training as well. Okay, you are giving, mass, giving me remembrance of once I, had, I ask uh, Professor Nosp, very well known due to endoscopic uh, surgery for pituitary adenoma. And I ask Professor Nob, Nos, what is your favorite uh, holder for the endoscope? And he answered, my favorite uh, holder is the human holder. So <laughs> I, I, I do agree. So I have just one question. Do you remove a middle turbinate unilaterally, bilaterally? Do you remove superior turbinate? What is your um, technique to avoid these free hands, uh, three pe persons working in the in the surgical field. Of course, this is also the matter of the discussion. We must uh, preserve the olfaction. So, uh, rejection of the middle time left or the supra time left must be uh, uh, minimally as as uh, possible as possible. So. If you, we need uh, some more dissection, we remove the turbinate as well. This is a, uh, we collaborating with uh, ENT surgeon. Uh, it's a very important process for us to, you know, we are just a neurosurgeon, we are specialists for the brain management. We must, I am collaborate with the ENT, they are uh, specialists. And I am asked ENT surgeon to follow the patient after operation. And I want to say, Collaboration with ENT is very important. Now, you know, endoscope is first used by ENT surgeon for the uh, nasal cavity tumor. And finally, we collaborate with them and we start to remove the tumor uh, through the nose. And nowadays, as you know, maybe robotic surgery used to remove the transoral, transoral, transoral approach. Now, some, some doctor using a uh, transoral robotic surgery to remove the uh, pituitary adenoma with collaboration of the endo, uh, ENT surgeon. So we must, we must collaborate with the ENT surgeon. This is a message to you. Thank you very much. Okay, can I, I ask are... one question, Professor Miguel? Can I ask a question? I'm Dr. Suresh Nair. Yes, please go ahead, Professor Suresh. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Horta, what a wonderful lecture as usual. Uh, but what I want to uh, just ask you, am I audible to you? Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, no, very recently there was a study from 
University College of San Francisco by McDermott Group. Uh, they devised, uh, you know, because, you know, endoscopic surgery has become fashion of the day for many youngsters for uh, tuberculum meningioma. So this study was conducted in the U.S. many, and I don't know, many, many European centers also participated. This UCSF, they devised a score uh, based on the size of the tumor, involvement of unilateral or bilateral optic canal, and also either engagement or engulfment of the vessels. And they devised a score and then uh, they operated patients. Uh, uh, this was a prospective study. Some patients were operated through endoscope, uh, only through endoscope, and others were operated transcranially, beautifully you showed. And in the end, the conclusion of the study was the extent of resection and visual outcome were equal for both the group. Of course, they told that extension laterally to the optic canal extension beyond the, uh, beyond the crinoid process or heart tumor is very difficult to be removed through endoscope. But what important message which came out from that study and which I want to ask you, what they have found is for those tumors where they thought by they have removed totally, totally by endoscope and transcranial, the recurrence rate in that, uh, with that cohort of patients who is presumed to have total resection by both endoscopic approach and by transcranial approach, the recurrence rate was more for transcranial tumor. Because what they found was they can take out the bones, the stippled bone at the base, better through the uh, endoscopic route, and they found that these tumors, if you cannot do a Simpson grade one resection, uh, these tumors can grow from there. So your thoughts on that? So through transcranial route, do you remove the bone, basal bone also along with dura? And second thing, you also told that you do a combined surgery. Uh, combined surgery, same sitting transcranial and uh, uh, and uh, transphenoidal. Do you why do you want to do it at the same sitting or do you want to stage that and do these two questions? Whether you can re you remove bone also transcranial surgery so that that issue of recurrence is uh, uh, you can uh, always tell you also remove totally the bone and also why don't you stage surgery because many people stage transcranial uh, after uh, transphenoidal maybe after. Uh, three to six weeks or more than that, so that the uh, graft uh, had that flap which they have kept it has taken up very well. What are your comments on this? Thank you very much. May I, may I give you some comment? On your yeah, question? please. Please. So there is a, some the quality of the transcranial approach from the various, you know, some has a good hand, some are the different. Uh, sophisticated hand. So we cannot say total cranial approach is bad or good. Well, the surgery is always like that. So uh, so matter of the discussion in the surgery of the Tremangosera meningioma is adhesion to the acom, adhesion to the optic nerve. Even if we use transcranial trans uh, and nasal approach, we can't do not remove. So regard regarding the uh, extent of the direction, Transcranial approach is safe. This is my com comment. Of course, uh, I I want I didn't read the, the uh, publication yet. I want to check the publication. So, if the tumor is size is large, tight isolation present. We cannot remove the tumor even if we use both approaches. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Much. I think we can uh, get the concluding remarks from Professor Aris before we go on to the second lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Raya. Again, just uh, congratulate, congratulating uh, Professor Ohata on his wonderful lecture. I think that uh, even uh, nowadays, many of us are very much uh, in favor of endoscopic techniques for many cases. Regarding tuberculum meningioma, tuberculum cell meningioma, uh, we have to take into consideration that uh, probably endoscopic approach is not able to completely remove the lesion in certain cases due to invasion of the uh, optic canal. This is my personal impression. I very seldom do um, 
endoscopic approach for that kind of pathology. I do prefer transcranial approach. And I think that Professor Ohata very uh, just uh, in a very nice uh, manner, uh, make a sample and give uh, uh, references of the medical literature regarding how careful we have before making the choice of the surgical approach for tuberculosis and meningium. Thank you very much to Dr. Raya. Thank you very much, Professor Ojata, and congratulations again. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, you. thank you very much. Our honored guest will be staying back. So in case we have few more questions, we can come back to them later. May I kindly now invite Professor Stephen Florian for the second session. Uh, let me thank you for this honor to be a chairman of this very interesting uh, session. And uh, yes, uh, indeed, the topic uh, will follow. It's uh, very intriguing and uh, uh, very interesting also. I'm, I apologize, I'm happy to be co-chair with my friend uh, Miguel. I missed him and uh, I miss you all. Uh, I missed our meetings and our discussion uh, in, in the many meetings, but I hope next year we will meet again. Um, the topic of, uh, of unruptured aneurysms, it's uh, controversial. And uh, the control of seven millimeter, I don't know how our presenter will start and will present, but I have from the beginning some, uh, some questions, but I, I will leave them to the end of the presentation. I also have a quite large experience in treating, especially surgically treating the unruptured aneurysm and I'm eager to, to hear your presentation. I'm, I'm sure that uh, it will rise up a lot of discussion and, uh, and uh, uh, questions um, about a treatment which is uh, prophylactic for something that could be dangerous, but the treatment is not without important risk. So, uh please tell us about the unruptured anyways thank you very much thank you professor florian and thank you dr raja thank you all the illustrious uh, members of the panel here i'm pretty small compared to you all and uh, let me sort of put a disclaimer right in the front i'm not actually a professor or anything of that so it's very kind of dr raja to address me as such i'm just a neurosurgeon trying to do my job here so <laughs> Uh, what I'll do is I will go through the, this seven millimeter thing has bugged me for a long time. And I've done quite an extensive amount of work and we've done some work in Middlesbrough uh, and I'll tell you why and what work we've done and why we are so uniquely placed to do it. So I'll start sharing my screen and then uh, see where we go from there. Um, I hope the presentation is visible and I'm yes. audible still. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Right. So uh, I am a neurosurgeon in uh, James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. We are in the north of England, uh, between Newcastle and Leeds. It's a lovely part of the world in general with uh, lots of good natural beauty and uh, very uniquely placed to sort of answer some questions about uh, the unruptured aneurysms. And the reason I say that, I, I will come to it, uh, there is a huge genetic uh, element to aneurysms in this part of the world. And there are certain reasons for it, which I will come to slightly later on. But uh, suffice it say that this business of unruptured aneurysms is, is, is quite important for neurosurgeons. As it is, uh, vascular neurosurgery is, is seen to be under threat. I don't believe that is the case, but uh, by and large, that is supposed to be one of the things that is under threat. Now, 40, 50 years previous to now, life was easy. Uh, if at all, you were discovered to have an unruptured aneurysm, uh, and that would be by, the, by virtue of having an angiogram for uh, another aneurysm that had ruptured, and during in the process of another uh, angiogram for some reason or the other, 
Uh, you would go to a neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon would, by and large, discuss things with you, and you'd end up having that aneurysm clipped via a craniotomy, and the results were pretty good. Uh, and, or at least that is what was supposed to be the case. Um, life isn't so easy now. We live in the world of information. We live in the world of Zoom and uh, data and information is available everywhere. So this has caused a lot of issues in general. And the other problem is uh, where a lot of people did not even know that they had an unruptured aneurysm, people are getting scans for various reasons and they are discovering a lot more unruptured aneurysms and the anxiety associated with finding an unruptured aneurysm is quite significant and therefore I thought this topic does merit some discussion and controversy. Now as I said on, on an angiogram which was sort of done previously the uh, the resolution and the sort of uh, things that you could detect on, on even on early CT scans were somewhere around one centimeter. And even the first ILS UIA study that was published, uh, the first experience uh, is reported that aneurysms less than one centimeter weren't a problem. Um, the, the experience of uh, John Jane Sr., who had published some of the earlier articles on unruptured aneurysms, was similar. And by and large, they weren't very dangerous and you could leave them, but that was mainly a review of literature rather than a true longitudinal follow-up. When the ISUIA group published their second iteration of their study, which was in 2003, uh, that is when by that time they had realized aneurysms between seven and nine millimeters were also an issue. And therefore that one centimeter came down to seven millimeter. Now, as our colleagues in Japan and Finland kept collecting very high quality longitudinal data, that seven became six, then that became five. And in some recent publications, the, the threshold has even come down to four millimeters. And by and large in Europe and in the United Kingdom, if you sit in the clinic or discussing things with a patient, uh, the, the big thing is the seven millimeter. What we've got to understand and what we've got to sort of think about is, is there really a basis for this seven millimeter apart from just convenience? And uh, I will present the arguments one way or the other and you can make your own mind up. Um, is there a statistically correct way of identifying a threshold? Now that's the first question. Uh, I, looking at the ISUIA data and the data previous to it, uh, I can tell you, I cannot find any statistical correlation or any statistical method that was followed. It was purely as a consequence of surgeons' uh, biological plausibility and the experience and the sort of uh, general uh, impression of what happens is, is that this thing came down to about seven millimeters. When we try to do that statistically, what exactly are we trying to do? Now, in this particular scenario, if we are analyzing data for unruptured aneurysm statistically, what we tend to use is the survival analysis where survival is not calculated on the basis of the terminal event, which is death, but the terminal event here is aneurysm rupture. And therefore the covariate of that is the size. And therefore what we are trying to do is con convert a continuous covariate, which is time, uh, which is the size of the aneurysm, which is a continuous variable into some sort of a, a dichotomized binary outcome. And this actually is possible statistically, assuming there truly is a threshold, but the method to do this is actually quite complex. And I've put a couple of uh, papers here, which actually goes through the data and, and how exactly to do it. And I will quickly sort of uh, run through the, the correct method of doing it. Uh, this is done very regularly in medicine, don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we do it left, right and center really. Um, and we, we do it, either based on data orientation or whether it, it is outcome oriented. Now, data oriented meaning you say, for example, if we have to identify the data into two things in terms of age, so we divide it into say elderly and not so, uh, and young, and, and that in terms of GBMs and tumors, that threshold is somewhere between 65 and 70, depending on where you look at it. And that's a data oriented thing. Uh, whereas if you have to do it 
based on outcome, whereby the outcome is actually impacted by if you where you place the threshold, it then ideally has to be done statistically. So if you then assume in that whole data, S to be the risk factor, which in this case, let's say is the size of the aneurysm and uh, the continuous variable and then the censure variable is the rupture, that, that is the outcome variable. And we, the size is then a covariate. The way to do this is then divide the whole population into two groups based on some arbitrary cut point to begin with. This doesn't have to be the cut point you want or you ultimately need, but this can be anything arbitrary. Now, based on events, their times and their frequency in the groups, which is above and below the cut point, you then work out a Lagrange statistic and you then do multiple iterations to then work out what is the maximized value of that point C, which is that arbitrary cut point, at which point the difference between the groups above and below the cut point C is, is maximized. And that is the correct way of doing it. The reason why most people or most statisticians don't go to the extent of doing that is because it is a very labor intensive process and most statistical software that are currently available won't actually give you this as a, as a sort of innate ability to do it. Uh, you, you actually need to write your own program and the macros to do this. As far as I'm aware, this method was not used in ISUIA or for that matter in any of these aneurysm studies. And the communication generally between the clinicians and the statisticians was limited so much so that uh, in the first iteration when the ISUIA appeared, a posterior communicating aneurysm, which is an anterior circulation aneurysm, was classed as a posterior circulation aneurysm. And then the whole data had to be reanalyzed and things were changed. Now, is it possible to then go back to this data and use this method to try and see whether or not you can work out a threshold and will it yield anything different? The answer to that is probably yes. If the data can be obtained, uh, it can be done. Will it yield anything, anything different apart from seven millimeters? I don't know. I suspect if we pull the data in from the world, uh, we might actually end up with a different threshold depending on what it is. So therefore, this seven millimeter thing, as I've sort of said to you, is, is pretty much an arbitrary thing, but this is the best we've got. Now, ISUIA never gave us uh, the proper yearly bleed rates from different uh, aneurysms at different locations, whether or not they were incidental or additional. And that was uh, done by analyzing the ISUIA data by the group in uh, Newcastle by Mendelo and Mitchell. And the table on the right, the table one that you see, that is probably a very good indicator because the posterior communicating artery aneurysm has then been sort of brought into the anterior um, circulation in there. And that, that, that sort of a thing tends to work much better. The current understanding of why and how we treat unruptured aneurysms is based on ISUIA. It's based on uh, the Japanese studies, the SOV, the UCAS studies, which are exceptionally well-conducted studies and a longitudinal follow-up of about 35 years by Juvela et al. from uh, Finland. There are some studies ongoing in Switzerland. We haven't really heard anything specific from them. There are the scores, uh, the phases and the UIATS and the aneurysm ratios, which are part of all of this as described by Nader Sepahi et al. from uh, Southampton uh, well back. So does size matter at all? Um, you'd see 51% of the coiled aneurysms and 53% of the clipped aneurysms in ISAT were greater than seven millimeters, which means the rest of them, which is 49 and 47%, which is actually quite a high percentage, were less than seven millimeters. So therefore, small aneurysms do pose a risk. The median aneurysm size in the BRAT trial was six millimeters. So this seven millimeter thing doesn't always hold water as, as it is. So size probably does matter. I think this, the size of the aneurysm does depend uh, does is a very important factor in determining whether or not an aneurysm will rupture in the future, but we're not really clear what size it is that matters. So what are the other factors here? You've got age, comorbidities, and the risk of surgery in a particular surgeon's hands in terms of clipping, coiling, 
there are things like the outflow angles, the aneurysm aspect ratios, the presence of vascular disorders, the presence of multiple lobules, and whether the aneurysm belongs to one of the communicating arteries. Okay, so th these are the well-recognized factors as such. And taking all of these things into consideration, our group in uh, Holland came up with the phases score, which is very good when it comes to discussing things with the patients in the, in the clinic. But I draw your attention to a fundamental fallacy of the phases score. Now, unless you are treating large aneurysms in Japan or Finland, your chances of going beyond a phases score of nine is very small. And by and large, the risk of treatment, a risk of surgery generally is sort of pretty static at anywhere between two and 5%. Now, whether it is surgery endovascular, that is the generally accepted quoted rate. Most people won't quote anything less than that. And if you look at it, most of the times, as I said, unless you're treating large aneurysms in Finland and Japan, um, either in the posterior circulation or in the communicating arteries, you really haven't got much chance of going beyond a phase score of nine. The other big problem is uh, if you're sitting with a patient who is in their 30s or 40s, giving them a five-year risk of rupture of 1.3% is, is all good but you probably will be having the same discussion with that patient every five years for the next 40 years. And do you really want that? Because you know that patient at some point or the other will become medically unwell or will end up having something or the other. Uh, and then he won't really thank you for that. So you say, well, doctor, you've been discussing this with me every year. Every five years we discuss this and you used to tell me that it's five year risk is X, Y, and Z, therefore we won't treat you. And here we are, 25 years down the line, here's my aneurysm, it's ruptured, and I'm in trouble now. So I think that's a fundamental fallacy of the phases score. To try and control that or to try and sort of uh, circumvent that, uh, the German group uh, with, with combination with a lot of other neurosurgeons from the entire uh, world came up with this Delphi process. And this had a lot of other factors uh, and came up with a Utah score. And you could either end up with a score which favors a repair or favors uh, a conservative management, depending on what other factors and what other boxes you ticked. You see, one thing that is there, which is what I sort of alluded to previously, was the surgical intervention risk is sort of kept constant at about 5% there. And that is probably what you're looking at most of the times. So what is the global experience with phases and UTAS? And there are several recent papers on that. Uh, there are two methodologies to try and see whether or not these scores work. Now, the prospective ones, which are few, is that you sort of apply the phases scores or the UTAS scores to all the patients that come through your door, and then you follow them up and then see which ones of them rupture. Or you apply the phases and UTAS retrospectively to ruptured aneurysms and see whether or not they would have merited treatment had they presented to you in an unruptured state. And generally, the findings of most of these studies are the phases scores are very low for most of the ruptured aneurysms, which means had these aneurysms presented to you in an unruptured state, you would not have picked them up and you would not have treated them. You would have been lulled into a false sense of security uh, by the phases score and the small five-year risk of rupture. And therefore, you would not have done anything to it. And that fundamentally brings to question the whole utility of these scores, if we are grossly underestimating the risk of rupture and the sensitivity of the UITS at times has been quoted to be somewhere close to 44%, are we grossly underestimating the risk of rupture and undertreating patients? And um, I think that that is up for question really. I've got a question here for most people. I mean, obviously we can't answer here. It's, it's not a live session, but this is a cute little baby. Um, could you guess who this cute baby is? Churchill. This is him. Hitler. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this cute little baby grew up to be Adolf Hitler. And could we have pre predicted that? And I think this is what it is. You, you can see some morphological similarities. You put both these pictures side by side. You see there is some similarity between the childhood picture and the picture in adulthood. So that brings us to the question, is it in the morphology? Is it in the phenotype? Are there two different phenotypes? 
And can we then identify these aneurysms as soon as we see them? Because, you know, the, the sort of phenotypic blueprint or the phenotypic stamp should be on the aneurysm when we see them. So what are the, what are the parameters? What are the phenotypic characteristics of aneurysms then? There are the inflow angles. There's the ratio of the parent and daughter vessels. There's the shear stresses and then flow dynamics. And that, that is more sort of dynamics and mobility of the things, uh, the, the flow of the blood in it. But the actual size, the shape, and those sort of things are part of it. So that brings us to the next question. Now, we measure aneurysms in two dimensions. And neurosurgeons are very good at converting two-dimensional data into three-dimensional um, models inside their head and then operating. And generally, the better a surgeon is at doing it, the better their hands and better their understanding of anatomy is. So is volume a better measure of the whole question? So is, is, instead of saying seven millimeter, should we, should we go and say, well, one cubic millimeter aneurysm or something of that sort? And can we actually then measure the volume accurately enough? Now, if, if that is an issue and there are certain papers that have been able to measure the volume and it's, it's coming up as a big thing uh, of late, that then raises the second question. Does the morphology of the aneurysm change before and after rupture? Which means if the aneurysm morphology change, does not change enough, can the pre-rupture morphology or the post-rupture morphology be used as a surrogate for uh, the, the morphology that this aneurysm had all through. And that is something that is not very clear. Now, we did a study in, in James Cook and we published it in the British Channel. Uh, and, um, we found that the aneurysms close to rupture do increase in size a bit and they develop occasionally some daughter sacs. But the general shape and structure of that does not grossly change. So therefore, the post-rupture morphology, so ruptured aneurysms can be used as a surrogate for, uh, let's say, if we are to consider phenotypic aneurysms that will go on to rupture, they can be easily considered as a surrogate for that. And uh, there's a group, uh, the, the group from um, US is, has presented similar data, but their experience is that this si change of size is quite gross. The, the morphology, the shape doesn't change, but the size changes significantly. And that is something that we found. The changes in size that we observed were not that great, but they were still there. What is, what is the next thing? The, the aspect ratio has been well described. So if you've got an aneurysm which is constricted at the neck and has got a big dome, uh, it's, it's got a high aspect ratio. Uh, if it's got a wide neck, uh, it's got a large space to go through the jet of blood that is going through this aneurysm is much smaller and uh, it's, it's at a lesser risk. And this was proven to be a significant risk factor. The aspect ratio was 2.7 in ruptured aneurysms versus 1.8 in unruptured aneurysms. You can expand this to several things and uh, you can measure uh, the parent vessel inflow and outflow diameters and all of that. And the important thing here is this inflow angle. And I'll show you in the next slide how that implies and what implication that has. So this is a PCOM aneurysm from one of the papers uh, published recently. And you see, this is the internal carotid coming through. And what it shows here is that the larger inflow angle, which is an easier flow of blood into the aneurysm dome, is a higher risk factor compared to a lesser inflow angle. And we're very well aware of this fact that fluid as it is will generally find, find its own way. And the easier it is for fluid to get to the aneurysm dome, the easier it is for it to get there, create turbulence, create further wall shear stress, and cause a rupture. So that's an important aspect. Aneurysm morphology, as I said, is, is, is important. There have been several publications of late, including uh, hemodynamics and things. And, and you, you will get a lot of papers at different sites trying to sort of uh, gauge the morphology and whether or not it has any impact on trying to predict the rupture. We, we have uh, quite a significant amount of experience of this. I'm sorry, I won't be able to share the explicit details of it, but I'll give you the basic gist of it. We have data for about 430 aneurysms from 330 patients. And we've uh, measured all these morphological parameters. Uh, and, and what we did was we put it into a machine learning algorithm model. And we were able to show 
and this is uh, been submitted that is why i am not able to show the entire details um, is that uh, one could predict 56% of the variability or the risk of rupture uh, when analyzed purely by morphological parameters now that is quite high because most of the current scores are only able to explore or explain about 44 to 49% of the variability in the risk of rupture now, if the morphology was combined with several other things, which included uh, comorbidity, smoking, the site of the aneurysm, and, and all the other sort of uh, things that we uh, generally put into all these scores, the efficacy of this grading system went to close to 80, 89%. And if you added computational flow dynamics as well, uh, it went to close to 92, 93%, which is, which is pretty good. Um, these are just a few of the studies that uh, we've currently got and uh, sort of go through the regular shapes and the risk factors for aneurysm growth. Aneurysm growth is important. Um, obviously, aneurysm growth is important because a lot of these aneurysms that we tend to follow up because we're telling them that the phases scores are quite low. So we're then obliged to follow them for five years. And this is becoming uh, a big practice the world over. And clearly, once you start to follow these up, inevitably aneurysms will grow. And if they grow, they are then thought to be changing and then considered to be candidates for treatment. And during follow-up, aneurysms will rupture as well. Now, the rate of growth and the rate of rupture is generally thought to be anywhere between 0.95 to 1.1%. 0 0.95 from the UCAS study in Japan, 1.1 from Juvela's long-term longitudinal study. And by and large, most units that follow up aneurysms will tell you it's pretty similar. Um, the risk factors for aneurysm growth remain exactly the same. Surprisingly, the risk of growth up actually is, is, is slightly less in Finnish and um, Japanese populations. I'm not sure why that is the case, uh, because the data collection is far more accurate and far better in, in Finland and Japan, as far as I can tell. And I think part of the problem with all of this growth and everything else is the aneurysm cycle itself. Where in the aneurysm cycle have we actually caught this aneurysm? So this has been a well-recognized thing. There are three or four patterns to aneurysms. You could have an aneurysm that uh, starts, it grows, and it ruptures. You could have an aneurysm that starts, grows, keeps growing, and stabilizes but never ruptures. You could have a small aneurysm that grows, to a small size and then ruptures quite easily. And you could have one which gets to a very stormy course, uh, develops pretty quickly, develops um, and, and, and does not really grow or show any growth, but ruptures before anybody uh, catches a whiff of it really. And that is probably the most common. And that sort of variability in aneurysm growth and uh, the, the way an aneurysm sort of behaves itself as it were, is, is the fallacy here. Now, is there a way of trying to find it out? I suspect apart from living in an MRI scanner uh, for your entire life, I don't think there is any. Uh, so I don't really know if anybody has any ideas of how we can actually solve this problem and, and actually work out what exactly and how this thing actually tends to happen. Briefly touch upon familial aneurysms. Uh, now, if it's morphology, the answer must be in studying twins and familial aneurysms, and I think that's generally considered to be the case. There are lots of studies, including the genetics of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is a large UK study collaborating with a lot of centers over Europe. Uh, we contributed a lot of data to it over the years, and uh, by and large, familial percentage of aneurysms um, is considered to be around 10% uh, in most places. Middlesbrough tends to have about a 23% uh, familial incidence. Uh, so 23% of our aneurysms uh, have some sort of a family history. And when I say some sort, what we, what we mean here is two or more first degree relatives. Now we've gone into the reasons for it. Apparently it turns out that the population in Middlesbrough came from Northern Ireland uh, primarily, where there is a similar pattern of unusually high familial incidence. And the reason was that there was a lot of mines in Northern England and Middlesbrough at that time. And uh, the, the genetic uh, structure of those populations is very similar. 
with familiar aneurysms, uh, they generally tend to be a lot of mirror aneurysms, so similar locations, bilaterallys. Uh, MC aneurysms are quite common and they tend to rupture younger. The morphology per se of familial aneurysms, as far as I can tell, or with our experience and looking at the literature is not much different from any of the other unruptured aneurysms. Um, there are some really good uh, papers from uh, our colleagues in uh, Holland uh, from this uh, wrinkle and colleagues have, have written quite a few papers on this. And it was a real pleasure to interact with them in the subarachnoid conference um, in 2019 after which uh, we haven't really met in person. Um, and um, we, we correlate uh, with them and we sort of collaborate with them occasionally on, on familial aneurysms uh, as well. So in summary, uh, we really know wiser. I mean, this, this, I've just told you that the seven millimeter rule doesn't really work very well. The treatment scores pretty much are rubbish. And uh, there are a lot of other things, but there is no unified uh, algorithm that we as surgeons can actually tell a patient that um, well, this is your lifetime risk of rupture, this is the risk of treatment in my hands, uh, your choice really. So effectively it boils down to, as long as your surgical morbidity mortality remains at reported and stable levels, a patient has a life expectancy of at least 10 additional years and uh, the patient has uh, a significant decrease in the quality of life knowing that he has an unruptured aneurysm, um, you probably are well within your rights to offer that patient a treatment uh, or uh, a repair of that aneurysm. What do we need here? We actually need a mechanism to find out an estimated lifetime risk of rupture and then a fairly accurate one at that, which probably incorporates um, most of the scientific data that I have sort of put forward before you with a sensitivity and specificity close to 90%, with a reasonably good prospective validation and uh, a risk retrospective validation depending on how we do the modeling and personalized to the patient and sort of incorporating the anxiety and all those sort of effects that the patient uh, tends to have. The future directions, and this is something that we're working on in, in uh, Middlesbrough quite a lot, is uh, morphologically, are we able to identify the rogue aneurysms that will go on to rupture? So effectively identifying a rogue from a single picture. Uh, the flow dynamics, the irregular shapes, um, and we, we've got together a group of uh, engineers and fluid dynamic uh, scientists really, and we sit down with all sorts of tubes in our free times to try and discuss these things. We've got a few uh, pieces of data, but we're still working on it, and hopefully in some time uh, we would be able to come up with some more reasonable answers for uh, our colleagues that we can use and then give patients a bit more um, reliable information than we currently do. Thank you very much. Um, I put my email in there for uh, whoever wishes to contact me and collaborate. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions by email as well. Uh, thank you so much everyone for giving me a chance to talk and uh, I hope I have raised some questions here and I hope some of it that uh, I have said actually makes any sense. So I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. Kindly unmute yourself, Professor. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, very comprehensive review on the, the uh, criteria and statistical methods to evaluate uh, unruptured aneurysm. Uh, yes, there are a lot of technical aspects which cannot be really applied in the daily discussion with our patient. So, uh, first of all, I have a, a, a question from Dr. Kuntal. Uh, he is asking, what is the role of vessel wall imaging an oral aspirin. So vessel wall imaging and aspirin is a, is a contentious point. Uh, it depends on who you ask, really. If you ask uh, David Hassan's group from uh, Iowa, uh, they believe in it uh, big time. Uh, they do it quite a lot. And there is currently a, a German study between Germany and uh, I think US uh, where they are recruiting patients uh, 
uh, and testing the sort of efficacy of aspirin now it would it would sound logical and stand to reason that if what indeed you are seeing in the vessel wall imaging as a hot spot is inflammation therefore anti inflammatory medicine should help control that and therefore prevent uh, rupture uh, incidentally uh, i think a retrospective analysis from the isuia group did suggest that uh, people who were on aspirin uh, the patients who were on aspirin in in that group had lesser rates of rupture uh, this is obviously retrospective the problem with analyzing data retrospectively is that you you sort of have a hypothesis and you have a bias in mind and uh, i suspect we probably got to wait for the result of this uh, trial to come through and then uh, decide what the role of aspirin will be okay thank you my my personal question it's more practical so based on your huge knowledge on this statistical data uh in a practical mode how you discuss with a patient with an unruptured aneurysm with a um, 5 mm in anterior communicating artery uh, syst- uh, system okay so the way we do it in in our hospital is that uh, by and large i don't sit with them alone so we with three of us sit together there will be two surgeons and one endovascular neuroradiologist so three of us sit together uh what we do is we describe the actual anatomy and the size and everything else uh, in, in three dimensions so not not just measuring it 2d but we actually go to the process of uh, doing the 3d reconstructions and and showing the patient where the aneurysm is and what it is the the logical the, the sort of guideline we follow is that 7 mm is only a guide okay so if it if it comes down to one of the communicating arteries which is either the anterior communicating artery or the pecom uh, we are slightly um well we are actually quite significantly lax on the size of it we also take into consideration whether or not the patient has any family history given our region um, that is quite important and far more important we we do take into consideration what is the quality of life lost with the patient knowing that they have an aneurysm and there is this x y and z chance that it might rupture now the risk of rupture that we quote is not based on phases or uits we still quote the isuia risks which are based on the 7 mm thing because unfortunately as things stand we don't really have anything better to go by because that is the only one which will give you a annual risk of rupture which you can then technically extrapolate into a lifetime risk of rupture and that is what we tend to believe in here we don't believe in the business of uh, talking about 5 years because i think the problem with 5 years is that if you're speaking to a 75 year old or 70 year old patient maybe maybe they might be okay with talking about 5 years and 10 years but if you're sitting with a 40 year old patient with an unruptured 5 mm acom aneurysm 5 year risk of rupture means nothing to them um, and therefore we balance out the lifetime risk of rupture with the results of treatment in our hands both endovascular and surgical uh, we also explain to the patient quite clearly that while the lifetime risk of rupture is distributed over his entire or his or her entire lifetime the risk of treatment which is to the tune of approximately 5% or give or take whichever it is depending on the the, the actual morphology of it is all of it is taken on one day so therefore if something does go wrong on that particular day these are the problems that could go wrong and if the patient knowing all of this uh, then decides that yes that is the right thing for him the, him or her then, then that is what we do and we always tend to give the patient we we never ask the patient to make the decision there and then because they feel pressured with surgeons and radiologists sitting with them we send them home with the information we get them to call us in a couple of weeks time so that they can have they have then made the decision and then they can tell us what they want if they tell us that they want it treated by x y or z whichever method it is then we do it that way if they tell us that they don't want anything done uh, they will just follow it up then we put them into a follow up arm and we follow these up 
uh, we follow them up till about the age of 60 or 10 years, whichever comes earlier. Um, but generally, we tend to take them to about 60, 65 years of age and scan them depending on what sort of an aneurysm is it and how we feel about it and the morphology of it. And the morphology of it has played a very major part in, in the recent times. And if we have aneurysms with the daughter sacs or if we see the the actual jet of the blood that might be flowing into the aneurysm straight away. So say, for example, it's a terminal carotid aneurysm where you've got the full force of blood from the internal carotid flowing right into its dome uh, versus uh, M1 aneurysm, which is in the anterior temporal territory, which is pretty much a sidewall aneurysm. I think the risk of rupture, you would completely agree, is, is very different because of the flow. And, and those sort of things do come into the part and we do explain whatever uh, we can to the patients in this regard as well. So that's how we do it. So uh, do you give some, some, some advice in order to, to uh, direct their decision? So um, we, we are not allowed to give them any specific advice these days. We're supposed to give them the data and we're supposed to let them decide. So we wouldn't, uh, but you're correct. I mean, your question is very valid because most of the times the patient comes back or would direct a question straight at you if it was your head or your aneurysm, what would you do? And that is then a difficult one <laughs> to answer. But we do answer it uh, based on all of these uh, facts and figures um, as best as we can and then, then let them make that decision really. Okay, uh, in a patient with... Um multiple aneurysms in which one was already treated. Yeah. What is your policy? Um, the, the policy generally is if, if, it's, if somebody has multiple aneurysms and they have, uh, one of them has been treated as a consequence of rupture, then uh, we would generally recommend treating the others. Unless of course it's a cavernous IC aneurysm, which is not at risk of causing um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage or anything of that sort. By and large, we would recommend treatment unless the risk of treatment is very high. So say, for example, um, it turn, turns out to be an aneurysm which uh, both our endovascular colleagues and surgical colleagues find um, slightly difficult to treat uh, or think that the risk of treatment is unreasonably high, uh, somewhere to the tune of 15, 20%, then we would probably err on the side of not treating it, but by and large, the policy would be to treat them. Okay, any other questions from the... Yeah, I think we'll open this for discussion, but uh, I would like to comment on Professor Mukherjee's talk that when Professor David Hassan was a previous speaker and chair on more than three occasions at the ACNS webinars, and he was asked the same question, if you get an aneurysm or five millimeters, what we do to Actually, he is one of the investigators of the UIT score. And he's very shocking that he doesn't believe in any of this course. If you have an aneurysm, you clip it and send him home. That was his <laughs> answer. <laughs> but that was really shocking. Yeah. Well, based on my experience, uh, I, I rather uh, advise the, 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 the patient to be treated. Not, sorry, he, he or she is the, the one who decide, but uh, my advice is to be treated. And uh, I think in the last in the last week, I operated two patients with ruptured aneurysms. Was uh, uh, one was uh, three millimeter on MCA bifurcation. The other one was on pericolosal artery, uh, four millimeters ruptured aneurysm. Um, so none of them was seven millimeters, uh, but they ruptured and the patient were severely ill. Now, fortunately, uh, both of them are, after the operation, are in a very good condition. But if we knew before, the advice will be not to operate or only to follow. How to explain to a patient like this which knows that he or she has a three, four millimeters aneurysm and he's coming in emergency with a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to explain to the family or to the patient. Well, 
bad luck. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. It, it's a it's a very difficult discussion uh, in general. The only uh, the uh, you're right i mean if if i if i had a choice i would probably say yes you probably should err on the side of treatment but uh, i think the way things are and the way the sort of landscape is currently i think it is probably incorrect of us uh, to give them any specific opinion i think basically we've got to give them all the information and then make their let them make their mind up and you know as long as long as they have enough information uh, and well, that, that is probably all we can do really not all the patients are able to understand this information you know <laughs> you are absolutely correct i mean it takes it it takes us it takes us a lifetime to understand and we don't understand it all my patients are informatic informaticians uh, it uh, uh, engineers in order to understand all the statistics and many of them are with a lower level of culture and they only ask it please doctor do something with yeah. this bomb in my head Right. and i think that is where that is where our role as surgeon is is to sort of try and um, allay the anxiety and and then basically try and explain it to them as best as we can really that's that's, that's all we can do it's what i am doing every day so i explain yeah. them and uh, for many for many patients uh, living with a undetonated bomb in the head it's a nightmare yeah. right and i think that is that is the that is one of the things if the quality of life deterioration as a consequence of the anxiety that the aneurysm brings on is quite significant then i think that is a very good reason for us to go ahead and treat and then we do that quite often it's it's a it's a common thing thank you thank you very much we can have the comments from professor ares as well professor miguel ares any comments from your side well uh... Thank you very much uh, for everything. I have enjoyed the, the presentation of Dr. Mujerki uh, regarding this uh, very important uh, topic. As uh, Professor Florian stated, this is one of the worries for many patients regarding this bomb inside uh, their head. And I think that uh, the presentation has been wonderful. Thank you for letting me now to be part of this wonderful webinar, and I'm very glad. Um, again, I'd like to congratulate the organizer and also the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can take one comment from our co-host, Dr. Liu Gun Singh. Thank you, Raja. Uh, I have a question to Professor Ohata. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, my question to you is, uh, we, we do, in my center, do a bifrontal cranotomy. Uh, uh, do you limit the opening of the dura? Because often when we do bifrontal and we have a bilateral dura opening, the brain will hang it and we have no choice to use retractor. But if we start with small uh, dura opening, uh, the dura itself become a, a retractor for the brain, avoid a brain herniation that would be cause less brain damage, uh, your comment. Uh, second question, Professor. In the pre-op scan that you found, if a patient will have a large uh, air sinus, air sinus, uh, any special technique that you use during craniotomy to open the A sinus without opening the mucosa of the A sinus? Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, dura opening, of course, limited. In the bifrontal approach, usually we cut the dura double shape. At the center of the dura incision, I cut the superior subtal sinus. This is a basic technique. This I don't like to change to the, this technique. And uh, this is a stereotype technique in the sub bilateral bifrontal approach. And uh, your question, next question is uh, spinal sinus, mucosa opening? Front yeah, uh, yeah. On front of air sinus, you, you have special technique to open without ah. opening the mucosa, ah. avoid opening the Frontal mucosa. sinus, yeah, frontal sinus, okay. I did it, uh, some schematic drawing how to pre, uh, repair the frontal sinus. I usually remove the oral um, uh, mucosa from the fr uh, bone flap and also the basal side of the mucosa. And uh, just I put the fat dish, fat dish, no repair with 
nobody are using a pericranial flap because in the longer flap period, the patient has a frontal uh, bone de deformity, fully deformity. So fat tissue insertion is good enough to repair the frontal sinus. This is uh, also a stereotype technique. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for it. Very much. One more question I would like to ask Professor Ohata is, what is the uh, protocol of giving steroids in these patients? Do you always use steroids post-operatively? Steroid, I, so it's uh, around 20 years ago, we used to use a steroid uh, to prevent uh, some uh, neural damage or uh, uh, prevent uh, some edema change of the brain. But uh, nowadays, we don't like to use a steroid. It's not you not uh, beneficial for the patient and as well for the surgeon. So this is my question, uh, answer to you. So I think if there are no more questions, we can wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers, Professor Kenji Hata and Mithi Mukherjee and the chairs, Professor Miguel Arez and Stephen Florian for that time and support for the ACNS webinars. We had a lot of learning today. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. Until we meet on 22nd, it is bye-bye from all of you.